Venice was nearly awash with fine painters throughout the 16th century, including some who only spent part of their career there, such as Sebastiano del Piombo, and a wonderful idiosyncratic painter named Lorenzo Lotto, whose dates were about 1480 to 1556. While Lotto was born in Venice and likely trained there, his first decades as a painter were spent in Treviso, Rome, and Bergamo. He lived in Venice again from 1525 to 1532, and twice more in the 1540s. Lotto's painting, Portrait of a Woman Inspired by Lucretia, was painted about 1530 to 1532, during his most extended stay in Venice. We see here that female portraiture, too, had changed considerably from the 15th century and was more common as well in the 16th century than it had been earlier. The format is enlarged with a three-quarter length depiction of this sumptuously dressed and bejeweled woman. She stands between a chair and a table holding a drawing in her left hand of a nude woman while she points with a right hand to a piece of paper with an inscription in Latin. The inscription says, after Lucretia's example, let no violated woman live quoting Lucretia's last words according to the ancient Roman historian Livy. Well, who was Lucretia? Lucretia was an honorable married woman of the legendary period of ancient Rome when it was ruled by the Etruscan kings. She was raped by the son of the Etruscan king and upon telling her husband and father of her violation, stabbed herself to death, preferring that to living with dishonor. To avenge her violation and death, her male, relative ro male relatives rose up against the Etruscan king and liberated Rome from his rule. Her act was held up as an example of supreme feminine virtue. Despite Christianity's strong condemnation of suicide, the story of Lucretia was revived during the Renaissance. Women were given her name, and many depictions of her were painted, a number of them somewhat incongruously as nudes. What this still unknown woman once emphasized, therefore, is her commitment to feminine virtue, especially chastity following, generally, the example of Lucretia. This woman might well have been named Lucrezia. Whether this painting was commissioned in connection to marriage is unknown, but she does wear her hair in the style of a married woman and also wears a gold ring. The very direct engagement with the viewer is unusual for a female portrait of this time, but understandable if the primary audience was thought to be her husband. The entire premise of the painting indicates the greater ambition of portrait painters and their sitters in the 16th century, aiming for character study, not just a likeness, idealized as this one may or may not be. I used the word idiosyncratic to describe Lotto, and one reason I did so can be seen here. Lotto's figures almost always lean or sway rather than stand upright. Thus, the upper body of the woman portrayed here is both tilted to her right and angled backward, while her head is posed in the opposite direction. He certainly have, as I said, a kind of a uncharacteristic approach to posing, but there is something very attractive about Lotto as a painter. A less well-known but still fascinating painter who spent much of his career in Venice is Giovanni Girolamo Savoldo. Our information about him is limited. We only know that he was active from 1506 to 1548. His birth and death dates are unknown. He styled himself da Brescia, that is, from the town of Brescia, and had patrons from this town, but we know nothing else of his origins or his training. Documents tell us that he was first active in Parma in 1506 and in Florence in 1508, but we do not know of any work certainly by him before 1520 at the start of his career in Venice. He was at times a strikingly original painter, as his Mary Magdalene in the National Gallery reveals. Painted about 1535 to 40, this painting presents a startlingly close vision of one of Christ's most loyal followers, Mary Magdalene, seen in half length. Identifiable by both her ointment jar and red dress, of which we get just a glimpse, she is cloaked in a shimmering gray-silver mantle. She raises her right hand, covered with fabric, in a gesture of mourning, while her gaze directly engages the viewer. 
She stands before the empty tomb, and we are meant to understand the moment as sunrise through the beautiful evocation of dawn over a landscape resembling the Venetian lagoons. Such a painting descends from 15th century depictions of sacred figures in half length, meant to serve as private devotional works. But these figures almost always were shown frontally in a timeless situation. Savoldo's Magdalene, with her body shown in profile but her head turned three quarters view, has a sense of substantiality and presence in a particular moment that freezes time and forces the viewer to think, what would I have done in this situation? How would my belief hold up in view of the empty tomb? This is a painter who has successfully used drama to heighten the religious meaning of his art. The two great painters of the generation or two after Titian in Venice, uh, Jacopo Tintoretto, whose dates were 1518 to 1594, and Paolo Veronese, are well represented in the National Gallery. Both were influenced by Titian and his success, but forged successful careers with their own distinctive styles. Jacopo Robusti called Tintoretto, or the little dyer, his father was a cloth dyer, a tintore in Italian, was an extremely productive artist, especially in the second half of the 16th century. And his primary clients were middle-class humanists and several of the confraternities, or scuole, in Venice. He also received commissions from the Venetian government to make paintings for the Doge's palace, succeeding Titian in this position. Much of his career was devoted to making large-scale narrative paintings. His style could vary tremendously depending on the uh, size of the commission and the status of the patron. St. George and the Dragon from about 1560 is likely to have been a commission for a private altarpiece given its size, high degree of finish for the artist, an unusual approach to the narrative. The story of St. George, as told in the Golden Legend, was the best known in the Renaissance. George was a knight born in what is now Turkey, but his great moment occurred in Libya. A dragon had terrorized a city there and first devoured all their sheep. Then they started giving him hu human victims chosen by lot. One day the king's daughter was chosen, and despite their ruler's entreaties, the citizens insisted that she too should be sacrificed. Dressed in bridal finery, she was let out of the city and left for the dragon. But George happened to come by, asked why she was weeping, and heard the tale. In the name of Christ, he attacked the dragon and told the princess to bind him, the dragon, with her girdle, whereupon they led the dragon into town. The people were terrified, but George explained to them that the dragon would no longer hurt them and that he, George, would slay the dragon if they all consented to convert to Christianity. They did, and George slew the dragon, and everyone lived happily ever after, except for the fact that George was later martyred under Emperor Diocletian. In the National Gallery painting, Tintoretto turned the narrative upside down by placing the princess in the foreground. She has seemingly fallen to her knees while on flight from the dragon. In the middle ground, we see St. George spearing the dragon through the mouth, while a corpse of one of the dragon's earlier victims lies on the ground nearby, stretched out, semi-nude in a pose resembling a crucifixion. A drawing by Tintoretto studying a figure in this very pose still survives. The landscape throughout the painting is turbulent in both concept and execution. There is a series of wave-like hills, a tree growing sideways, and a cloud-roiled sky with a visionary appearance in the center, probably meant to be God the Father. Typically for Tintoretto, all is in motion here. The figures who move in different directions and the brushwork itself. It is a wonderful painting that captures Tintoretto at his most refined, yet still dynamic. In his later career, Tintoretto attracted a more international audience. The origin of the Milky Way, painted around 1575, was owned by the famed art connoisseur, the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf II, who resided in Prague. The story is an allegory taken from mythology. Jupiter's son Hercules was born to a human mother. In order to assure him immortality, Jupiter approached his sleeping wife Juno and held the infant so that he might nurse from her. The rest of Juno's milk sprayed from her breast into the heavens, where it formed the Milky Way, 
or fell to earth where it became lilies. We know that almost a third of the composition was cut off the bottom of this painting at some point, but uh, from a drawing and from a copy of the painting, we know that lilies were originally included there, along with a female figure who represented the earth. This version of the story came from a Byzantine botanical book, the Geoponica, which had been translated and published in Venice twice in the 1540s. The unusual subject may have been chosen by the man some suggest was the actual patron of the painting, Tommaso Rangione. He was a man of wide erudition, though also quite a self-promoter, who was especially renowned in the areas of medicine and astrology, which was then a respected science. Rangione had adopted the story of the origin of the Milky Way as a kind of personal emblem for a medal he commissioned honoring himself, in 1562. He was also an important patron of Tintoretto's in Venice. The National Gallery painting could have been commissioned as a gift for either Emperor Rudolf or his predecessor, Maximilian II, who had knighted Rangione in 1572. The esoteric subject, however, would have had particular appeal for Rudolf II, who promoted learning of all kinds at his court. It is a typical Tintoretto painting in the complex poses and the challenging rendering of space, requiring the viewer to work through the painting's elements. It features crossing diagonals on the surface, this X pattern, while the strong light and the figural dynamics, where little cherubs are swooping in and out of the painting, along with Jupiter, make it all a very exciting composition. Tintoretto is known to have actually used little clay models for figures that he could pose in various ways and hang from strings so they could look as if they were flying. These were likely used to prepare such a complicated composition as this one. There is a much stronger emphasis on figural contour in Tintoretto's art than in Titian's. Remember how Titian, as well as other painters of the time, were really moving away from the contour of figures. This reflects Tintoretto's aim, according to a later biographer, to unite the disegno of central Italian artists, epitomized by Michelangelo, who was one of the heroes of Tintoretto, with the colore, that beautiful sense of color and light, for which Venetian artists were famed. Tintoretto also painted on a darker colored ground than Titian had. This was an innovation of the 16th century by many, though not all, painters on canvas. A priming layer would be laid on the canvas, sometimes on top of a gesso layer, sometimes in place of it. And this layer of the priming layer would have pigment in it, which would provide an overall tonality, ranging from light gray or brown to darker reddish browns or dark grays. So you could really vary the tonality tremendously just by what you put in the priming. Whereas in the 15th century, many painters wanted to exploit the effects made by the penetration of light through layers of oil paint and glazing, and the reflection of this light back off the light-colored ground on the support. In the 16th century, many artists wanted to create a sense of tonal unity for their paintings through such colored priming or ground layers. So it's a shift in that way of emphasis. Using these primings also enabled them to paint less thickly in the dark areas, and for highlights made up of lead white, they could apply them very quickly on the surface. Paolo Veronese, whose dates were 1528 to 1588, was the other leading Venetian artist in the second half of the 16th century. Born Paolo Cagliari in Verona, he was called the Veronese, or Veronese, after arriving in Venice, already trained in 1553. There he had a highly successful career, and like Tintoretto, was famed for his ability to compose large-scale canvas paintings. The National Gallery owns a fine collection of 11 paintings by Veronese, ranging in date from the mid-1540s through the 1570s, including portraits, religious scenes, mythologies, histories, and allegories. And some of the very largest paintings in the National Gallery are by Veronese. His family of Darius before Alexander from 1565 to 1570 is a wonderful example of his large-scale paintings many of which were composed as if they are theatricals performed before our eyes and before the eyes of the many onlookers in the painting as well. 
The story was told by Plutarch of how Alexander the Great, after defeating the Persian emperor Darius at the Battle of Issus in 333 BC, visited Darius' family. The emperor's mother humbly addressed the man she takes to be Alexander because of his height and noble attire. It was, however, Alexander's constant companion, Hephaestion. However, Alexander, proving his magnanimity even towards his enemies, stated that Hephaestion was indeed another Alexander, thus complimenting his friend and forgiving Darius' mother simultaneously. Indeed, as Veronese has painted the scene, uh, decent arguments could be made that Alexander is either of the two main male figures on the right. It's really hard to tell which one he is there. Veronese used the subject to provide a majestic pageant of color and light, of gorgeously dressed beauties and handsome men, of spears and helmets, horses, a monkey, and a dog, all set off by the gracious, monumental, classical architecture behind the foreground scene. So another way in which it looks like a theatrical, as if we have a stage set. Veronese is often accurately described as a decorative painter, but that does not mean he was not a superb narrator as well. It is instructive to take the painting as a whole and then to look at it from close up to see the range of techniques in it. Thus, the foreground figures are carefully executed and display the greatest range of lighting effects. When Veronese painted the middle ground, he provided contrast through its overall darkish tone which is then reversed in the background with figures sketched in lightly. Some, such as the horses at the left, have become almost transparent over time, and we can see how they were painted over the architecture. All of this works to guide our eye to the most important points, then allows us to enjoy the rest of the performance. A very good question is where would such a painting hang? most likely in a large Venetian palazzo, in a large reception room there, or in a similar space in a mainland villa. Many important Venetian families owned villas uh, on the territories owned by Venice in the mainland. The Pisani family, which owned the painting in the 17th century, has been suggested as a possible patron. The Allegory of Love, number four, Happy Union, from the 1570s, is one of a group of four allegories of love, alternating positive and negative scenarios, painted by Veronese for an unknown location, and all are now in the National Gallery. The pronounced foreshortening of the figures indicates that these were meant as ceiling paintings, a particular specialty of Venetian artists, including Veronese. That is, you can tell from the positioning that we are meant to see them from below. They would only make sense in that position. From a 17th century inventory, we know that the set belonged at some point to Rudolf II in Prague, who patronized, Ver who patronized Veronese from 1581 onward, but we do not know if he commissioned them. The painting we see here appears to be the climax of the set, with all discord and dishonesty left behind. A kneeling woman and a standing man come before a semi-nude figure, Venus perhaps, or perhaps abundance with her cornucopia, who holds out a myrtle wreath, symbol of love and fertility. The man and the woman both grasp an olive branch, symbol of peace, or in this case, union. They are accompanied by a cupid, who appears in all four scenes, and a dog, which may stand for fidelity. The soft, fleshy, blonde woman and the handsome man, all typical idealized types of Veronese, help to bring this allegory to life. Whether anyone took this series very seriously as a meditation on love, or whether it was seen as a convenient opportunity for sensuous, beautiful painting is impossible to know. Perhaps such a dichotomy is only one a modern viewer would dream up. Perhaps that wasn't understood as a dichotomy in the 16th century. Given the riches of this collection, we could continue with 16th century Venice forever, but we should move on to other northern Italian painters. We will look at portraits by two painters, teacher and pupil, who worked in Brescia. The elder of the two, Alessandro Bonvicino, named Il Moretto de Brescia, whose dates were about 1498 to 1554, spent his career in the ancient town of Brescia in the northern region of Lombardy, ruled by Venice, 
in the 15th and 16th centuries. From a family of painters already established there, Moretto had a successful career in Brescia and in the surrounding area, specializing in altarpieces and portraits. Both kinds of paintings are represented in the National Gallery's collection of 10 paintings by Moretto. We'll only have time to consider one of them, his masterpiece in portraiture. Portrait of a young man is datable to a period from about 1540 to 1545 through the man's clothing. It was owned by the Martinengo family of Brescia in the 19th century. It has been plausibly suggested that the sitter was Fortunato Martinengo Cesaresco, born in 1512. The portrait might then have been made at the time of his marriage in 1542, which accords with his apparent age here. Fortunato was a humanist scholar as well as a nobleman. Both sides of his character seem to be referenced here. He is extravagantly dressed and backed by a wall hanging of cloth of gold. His beret includes a jaunty ostrich feather, while his gloves, sign of the gentleman, rest on the table. We see him seated at this table in an imagined studiolo or private retreat, surrounded by ancient coins and a bronze lamp in the shape of a foot, and this was possibly also an antiquity. The sheen of the silk fabric of the man's sleeves, the softness of lynx fur, the shine of the sword hilt were all vividly suggested through oil paint. Other than the lavishness of this display, what is most striking here is the description of mood by Moretto. The young man slumps to one side with his head resting on his right hand, a traditional symbol of melancholy. His gaze is turned upward and he is unaware of our presence. What might explain this mood? His hat badge reads in Greek, alas, I desire too much. But what does he desire when he seems to have so much, too much, already? More of such rarities? Or was this a betrothal portrait for his future wife talking about desiring her? Clearly the patron and the painter knew, but we never will. It is in part the tension between worldly riches and psychological dismay evoked so successfully here that makes this painting so compelling. This expressiveness is reminiscent of Lorenzo Lotto's portrait, so it's perhaps no surprise to learn that they knew each other and that Lotto admired Moretto's paintings. Moretto's pupil, Giovanni Battista Moroni, whose dates were 1520 or 24 to 1579, was born in Albino, a town near Bergamo. He likely trained with Moretto in Brescia around 1532. During his career, he worked in Albino, Brescia, Bergamo, and also in Trent when the crucial church council was in session there in the 1540s and 50s. Though he did paint religious works, he was most active as a portrait painter and is best known for them now. Many of them are full length and life size or nearly so. There are 11 paintings by him in the National Gallery. 10 of them are portraits. Knight with his jousting helmet from about 1554 to 1558 is a fine example of his male portraiture and in very good condition. When it was in Palazzo Avogadro in Brescia in 1715, it was listed as a portrait of Conte Faustino Avogadro, a leading family member from the 16th century. Another portrait in the National Gallery by Moretto may actually depict Faustino's father, Gerolamo II Avogadro. Gerolamo II, Avogadro. In the Moroni portrait, a man looks out of the picture, holding the viewer's gaze steadily. He stands before a wall with a marble inlay at the bottom. The wall is broken at the top left. His highly ornamented helmet makes a strong impression, while other pieces of his suit of armor are scattered on the ground around him to left and right. He still wears some protection, a leather doublet with pieces of chain mail laced to it. A rapier is worn at a side of a kind that would be used in a tournament. One curious detail is the brace worn above the knee on his left leg, which supports his left foot. Was this worn because of a disability or a wound? There is no other clue to let us know. Moroni's portraits have a kind of liveliness in the characterization of the sitter and the ambiance. The flesh tones are attractively warm, noticeable here with the predominance of what are otherwise very cool tones. Lombard art had a strong naturalistic tradition, less idealizing in general than Venetian art, and it is apparent in this portrait. Moroni was a technically skillful painter whose pictures, including this one, are often still in fine condition. 
If this is Faustino Avogadro, it depicts him before conditions in his life changed for the worse. Clan loyalty involved him in a nasty and dangerous feud between two important families in Bergamo, the Albani, to which he was related, and the Brembati. And Faustino may have been involved in the assassination of one of the Brembati men in 16, 1563. He fled to Ferrara and, according to one chronicle, died the following year after falling into a well when intoxicated. Frederick Burton, then director of the National Gallery, bought four Moroni paintings for the collection on the same day in 1876, including A Night with His Jousting Helmet. A full-length portrait of a woman that had also been in the Avogadro Palace in the 18th century was among these four, and it is entirely possible that this painting, Portrait of a Lady from about 1555 to 1560, depicts Faustino Avogadro's wife, Contessa Lucia Albani Avogadro. She was a relative as well as his spouse. The two paintings, even if they depict a husband and wife, are not technically a pair, given the divergent compositions that do not respond to each other aesthetically and also differences in size between the two. But they were in the same collection from at least the year 1715 and could well have passed down through the Avogadro family line. While it was conventional for portraits of married couples to be commissioned together at the time of the betrothal or wedding, this was not an invariable rule. Whereas a knight with his jousting helmet impresses, this portrait dazzles. Often referred to as the Dama in Rosso, the Lady in Red, it is the kind of painting that calls to you across the room insisting that you come take a look. The color is rich and vibrant with the dress complementing the warm color of the sitter's cheeks and her reddish blonde hair all set against a silvery gray background. Her seated pose is less active and therefore more feminine by the gender conventions of the day. But she too looks out at us steadily, commanding our respect. Her dress and her jewelry are both sumptuous and highly fashionable for the period of the late 1550s and early 1560s. It is thought likely that if this is indeed a portrait of Lucia Albani Avogadro, Moroni would have painted it before she and her husband had to leave Brescia for Ferrara. She outlived her husband by only three to four years, dying by 1568, around the age of 33 or 34. This is a reminder of how much earlier people did die in the 16th century, even often those of noble background. Before that sad end, however, she was clearly an impressive woman of her time. The daughter of a Venetian patrician woman and a leading nobleman from Bergamo, she was also a poet, as several of her contemporaries mentioned in writing, praising her beauty and her literary ability. It seems appropriate that she is immortalized in such a remarkable painting. Through these examples of Venetian and Northern Italian painting of the 16th century, we have been able to trace the rise of painting on canvas, which helped to facilitate the increased size of many paintings and the spread of ambitious new portrait types. It is now time to turn back to central Italy to see developments there following the high Renaissance achievements of Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raphael.